The uh, lead time explosion and offsetting, here we've got a simple bill material with the lead time that it takes to uh, build each level in this uh, product structure. So the time from when an order is placed until a part is ready for use, that is the lead time. We explode that by multiplying the parent requirements by the usage through the product tree. And then we offset that by the lead time based on uh, either the planner or the buyer's estimate of how long it's going to take to actually place the order and have it ready for use. The bill of material is the basis of MRP. Back in the 1960s when uh, George and uh, Ollie invented MRP, they figured out how to take a due date of a final assembly, take the offset of the amount of time that it takes to build that particular product, and then use that in the MRP explosion. If you look at the total amount of uh, lead time, that's what's called cumulative manufacturing lead time. And if you're in uh, a responsibility of forecasting, you've got to remember that you need to forecast at least that cumulative manufacturing lead time. The basic process of MRP follows this dance of determining the gross requirements, and we'll look at how we do that, then determining available inventory on hand, scheduled receipts, and then projecting that across the horizon then calculating what we call net requirements. If you have a projected quantity on hand that's negative, that's the same as a net requirement. MRP is going to plan an order release for that period, offset it by the lead time to calculate the difference between the due date and the release date, and then write action messages. And that's what MRP does in its explosion process. This is done by low-level code, we'll talk about low-level code in uh, just a second, by item, by time period. So if you were to look at an example of this MRP explosion, if we've got a requirement for level zero, parent E, that means we have a gross requirement at the level one, component A1. So the gross requirement or the net requirement of the parent becomes the gross requirement of the component. Then we look at on hand and scheduled receipts to come up with total available. And instead of needing 100 of component B1, we actually only need 73. So the net requirement of the parent becomes the gross requirement of the component. In this case, we got five and a scheduled receipt for 25 or 30. Then we've got 43, that drives down to component C1. C1 has a gross requirement of 43. On hand, scheduled receipt, available, net, gross, available. And so you can see that we don't have any requirements or net requirements for our component four. So that's the, the explosion and netting process for those components. If we look at just a basic MRP uh, record. We can see here that we've got a lead time on this item of two weeks. We've got uh, five periods out in the future where we've got a gross requirement coming from a parent, uh, a scheduled receipt of 20, and we'll define scheduled receipts as paperwork released. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And we have a projected quantity available as 10, so if we simply go through and do this netting process, you can see we've got 10 at the end of period uh, one. We've got 30 projected available at period two because we've got the 10 and the 20. That 30 follows into period three. Period four has 30 because we have no requirements in uh, period four. Now in period five, we see 35. and that means we have a negative projected available. A negative projected available means we have a net requirement. A net requirement 
means we need to plan an order. We need to offset it by lead time. And MRP assumes that you're going to do what it says and you're going to release that in period three and it's going to come into inventory and your new projected available at the end of period five is zero. So that's the basic uh, flow of an MRP record. Now, if we expand that and we look at this part I or part number one, it goes into X. It also goes into Y. And as we saw from last week <clears throat> or last webinar, we also have uh, some independent demand for this, this part one. We've got 95 on hand. We've got allocations of 20, a safety stock requirement kind of three, and our lot size is 100. So if I look at the gross requirements across the periods, one through eight, of part number one, you can see that in the first period, that gross requirements comes from a forecast or a master schedule of one in period, or 15 in period one. And then since one goes into X and the four week lead time from period six back to period two says, I've got a gross requirement of 40 in that period two. Same thing for uh, period three, period four, period five, and finally period six. So that's the gross requirement, the accumulation of those gross requirements from all parents into the time period for this particular item that we're looking at. If you then go through that uh, netting process, you can see we've got 95, we've got 15, and an allocation of 20. So we've got 60 available at the uh, projected available at the end of period one, goes to 20. Now we've got a scheduled receipt of 100 in period three and a gross requirement of 40. That means our net projectable is 80. That 80 follows into period four, so 30 minus 80 is 50. We've got 35 at the end of period five. That carries to six. Now we've got a, a negative 10 projected quantity on hand. So if you look at the offset, you can see that we've got 90 coming in now based on that minus the 10. And then that covers into the next period. So that's kind of how MRP looks at uh, an item in its uh, gross requirement. And now if you look at the planned orders for uh, the release versus receipt, we've got this rule that the plan to release of the parent becomes the gross requirement of the component in terms of both date and quantity per. So if you've got 50 here at period five for that B item, that's going to drive down in release because the lead time, or lead time of that B is one period. B takes C and D, so that 50 release is gonna feed down to the receipt in the um, period two, lead time offset, lead time offset. So that's how the system calculates the explosion of those net requirements. There's some assumptions that MRP makes. Number one, it's gonna, you're gonna do what it says. It assumes you've told it the truth, so you need to make sure that what you are telling QED is actually the truth in terms of lead times, lot sizes, et cetera. There's uh, an assumption that it's easier to expedite an order than to place a new order. And we'll talk about that in terms of uh, the realignment or uh, rescheduling messages. And if uh, you told MRP it's gonna take a number of days to uh, place an order or complete a work order, that it assumes it's gonna be done in that time. It tells you to expedite and delay, and if it tells you that, it assumes you're successful with that. And then finally, one of my old uh, supply chain managers used to tell me that, have you told MRP everything you know? If you haven't, then you need to make sure that MRP knows it. 